So today I'll be talking about uh, mixtures and how to do objective interpretation and focusing on relevance, reliability, and acceptance. So a DNA mixture occurs when two or more people contribute their DNA to the same sample, and this is indicated here with a lot of DNA from an individual shown in blue with a 6-8 allele pair, a second allele pair from someone who's homozygous for a 7, and a third allele pair, that's a 7-9 from a third person, and the combination of these amounts produces a signature for this particular biological mixture. So I always begin analysis with a forensic question, and I'll describe data here from a case that I was involved in this year in Baltimore, which is a man, Nelson Clifford, who had previously been acquitted of sexual assaults in four cases, always pleading consent. An interesting story if you read about it in the paper. And this was a fifth case where his DNA was potentially found on some articles of clothing, a green shirt and a belt. And the question is, did the suspect, Nelson Clifford, contribute his DNA to the victim's clothing in this case? So the starting point for scientific analysis and forensics is Bayes' law, which is what lets us look at a small amount of data. And I'll use it twice here. The concept with Bayes' law is to use data to update our belief. The approach is 250 years old, but has gained a lot of speed in the last 50 years with the advent of digital computing. If you start all the way on the right in brown, you see that what Bayes' concept is that we start with some belief before we see data called the prior, and then green in the middle is that there's data that we look at and some likelihood function that describes how well a hypothesis explains the data is assessed to produce a probability number. All hypotheses are considered. And in the end, what our goal is, is how do the data update our belief shown in blue on the left, which is the posterior probability, which is the final belief after we've observed the data. Genotype modeling is just applying Bayes' law to genetic identification. We begin on the right in brown with a random population, the random genotype of what allele pairs would be, maybe 100 different allele pairs at each locus. Then quantitative data is looked at, usually short tandem repeat or STR data, and considering all possible possibilities of genotypes, but also other variables like stutter, degraded DNA, variances of all these parameters, and so on, are then considered. And after considering data, we then end up with a new genotype probability, and that is our belief in the different genotypes that we have for each contributor at each locus. So the starting point for scientific analysis with Bayes is the data. And so our starting point here is STR genetic data, which are quantitative peak heights here shown in this case at locus so one. You see a pattern where there's taller peaks at six and eight and lower peaks at seven and nine. And what's important about the data is you want to use all of it. The amounts of the DNA matter, so the peak heights will matter. The pattern of the highs and lows matter because that's how patterns can be explained with quantities of allele pairs and their artifacts. And the variation is also important in modeling the variance parameters of which there can be dozens in modeling a problem like this. For example, the six and eight peaks may represent roughly the same amounts of DNA that went in from one person, but you see variation in the peak height. Applying a likelihood function is then done to separate genotypes. And the likelihood here is the concept of how do you explain the data. So in considering every possible explanation, Here's one such explanation out of hundreds of thousands of explanations. In blue, there's a first allele pair at six and an eight. There's a second allele pair that's homozygous for seven. And then there's a medium amount of DNA for a third allele pair that's a seven and a nine. And if you add up the different allele pairs together, there's a pattern where the heights of those quantities of DNA from the alleles to a first approximation is very close to the heights of the observed data. So this would have a higher likelihood and confer higher probability to a separated genotype. So this is what a separated genotype looks like. The table in the center 
is showing that at 13 genetic loci, tho one's the first, and then there's another 12 listed in rows. At each of the three contributors that were assumed here, so for each of these 39 potential locus contributor pairs, there's a genotype. And in blue, what you're seeing is a bar graph where out of 100 or so possible allele pairs, the data has focused the probability onto about a half a dozen of these possibilities with different amounts of probability indicated on the left. This is an objective procedure that's unbiased by the suspect's genotype. It's also unbiased by an analyst clicking on peaks. Data just goes into a machine and then it's analyzed uh, automatically, which it helps workflow, but it also really helps with objectivity. So now we've obtained a separated genotype for each of these loci, for each of these contributor. What do we do with it? Well, our goal is to assess a strength of match. And so here we focus for a second on Federal Rule of Evidence 403, which talks about how relevant the evidence is. And the hypothesis that we're trying to assess overall is, did the suspect contribute his DNA to this mixture? The purpose of relevance is shown on the scale on the left, is to balance probative force relative to unfair prejudice. And the likelihood ratio does exactly this. The likelihood ratio is a form of Bayes' theorem where there's one hypothesis and we're asking to what extent does data increase or decrease strength in this hypothesis of whether someone contributed DNA. The likelihood ratio has a numerator that's to what extent the hypothesis is impacted by data that's inherently probative. It's how does data impact the hypothesis. And the denominator shown in brown is the initial odds of the hypothesis before data. And that tries by division, putting it in the denominator to factor away the prejudice of initial belief. So the likelihood ratio is designed uh, to be inherently probative and non-prejudicial. And all the way on the bottom right, it turns out that with several turns of Bayes' theorem and some algebra, we can calculate the likelihood ratio or the match statistic by looking at the posterior probability of a genotype after we've seen data divided by the random genotype before we've seen data. So that's where genotypes come in. They're a way of using the data to calculate likelihood ratios about a hypothesis. The match statistic in this case is quite simple because it's just like random match probability. How so? We're only looking at one contributor. There's a comparison of a separated genotype at a locus to an individual. We're looking at the question, to what extent does the suspect match evidence more or less than a random person might? And if we look at the graph on the bottom, the blue bars are the same posterior genotype probability distribution of the separated contributor at the tho one locus after the data has been seen, but then shown in brown in the background are a half dozen out of 100 allele pair possibilities of what the probabilities are for the random genotype of someone from the population. And now at this point, a comparison could be made to anyone, but in this case, the genotype of the defendant happened to be a 7-9. And so with that red bar, the cursor, we focus our attention on seven to nine, and we look at the ratio of the blue bar to the brown bar, that 47% to 13%. Why? That's the likelihood ratio. It's looking at the posterior genotype probability at the suspect's genotype divided by the probability of a coincidence. You see that that 47% over 13% is necessarily less than 100% over 13%. That would have been the random match probability. But in this case, in addition to having the rarity or coincidence denominator, there's the strength of match through Bayes' theorem in the numerator. And this is why it's simple to explain in court and very simple to understand with separated genotypes. These genetic loci are independent, so multiplying together these values, the amount of the match statistic or likelihood ratio is the length of the bar on the scale on the right. And then the 13 loci are listed from top to bottom, we see that we can state in English that a match between the shirt and Nelson Clifford is 182,000 times more probable than a coincidence. Now, it's also interesting to look at the exclusionary power of this separated genotype for this matching separated out 
genotype at the Thel1 locus. And what we've done here is compared 10,000 random genotypes with the separated probability distribution genotype, and we obtain this bell curve distribution that gives us the non-contributor distribution. This is what the match statistic looks like on a logarithmic scale for someone who did not contribute their DNA. We see the mean is about negative 10, which is 1 over 10 billion for exclusionary power, with a standard deviation shown in yellow at the bottom of about three log units. From this, we can calculate an error rate for a match statistic in that the math is shown in purple on the right, the likelihood ratio is 182,000. From that, you can get the log of the likelihood ratio, a z-score for a normal distribution, and a p-value, which shows moving out, as you see with the yellow bars, five standard deviations, that the chance of observing an individual who has a match statistic as high as 182,000 or more is one in four million. So what we've arrived at here is a separated DNA mixture. The green shirt was separated objectively into three genotypes, an 11%, a 82%, and a 7% contributor. After those genotypes were objectively inferred without examination bias with a suspect or any other reference, comparisons were made producing match statistics to the victim elimination and Nelson Clifford. Uh, the outcome of the case was that in this fifth trial, and also later on in the sixth one, the jury did convict Mr. Clifford of a sex offense. There's been a lot of validation of true allele. There have been dozens of studies done by ourselves and by labs that have true allele. First four studies shown are done on laboratory synthesized data of known composition, mixtures that are made in the laboratory. Bottom three papers are done on casework which has its own issues of complexity, and both should be done to validate a system. I'm going to focus on the latest paper that appeared in the Journal of Forensic Sciences online last week. This paper was done in collaboration with the Kern County Laboratory in Bakersfield, California, co-author Kevin Miller. It's entitled, Truly Genotype Identification on DNA Mixtures Containing Up to Five Unknown Contributors. It has an interesting random study design. We looked at about six axes. One of them, for example, is what happens as you change the number of contributors. And what we were able to show is that once there's a sufficient number of contributors, the match statistic doesn't materially change in true allele. So if there's actually three contributors and you assume three, four, or five, you'll get the same statistic. So in the case of true allele, knowing the number of contributors is largely irrelevant to using it. I should also point out on the top right, this is an open access article. You can download the PDF, send it to your friends and colleagues, and discuss it all night if you'd like. So three axes of interest out of the axes we looked at includes specificity, sensitivity, and reproducibility. Specificity is really important for court. It's nice to have validation studies or several dozen of them on your methods. Here we see distributions where comparisons were made from inferred genotypes that were separated out from mixtures relative to random genotypes conducting millions of comparisons. The data are on a log LR scale. The blue vertical line is zero log LR or no information. We see as we move from two, three, four, five contributors that the specificity, the exclusionary power decreases. So by the time you're at five contributors, maybe it's down to one in a billion on average. This is data for low template DNA. And what's very important from here is the notion of the false positive table, which is part of the paper or the additional items. And that gives you an error rate in court. If you're asked in court, what's the chance with a match statistic of 10,000 that you would see an event, you can give a number, whether it's one in 50,000 or one in a million or never, the data has been collected and analyzed. Sensitivity then examines to what extent someone who has contributed their DNA to a mixture is detected. And we see that the curve shifts to zero and past it as we go from two, three, four, and five contributors, so that with five contributors, more than half of the identifications are made at very low amounts, like five and seven percent, but not all of them. Reproducibility at 
two, three, four, and five contributors is shown by running the program twice, the random algorithms, and then a point on the plot is showing the log likelihood ratio from the two independent computer runs. They all nicely line up along the 45 degree angle, showing that the numbers are essentially the same, and there are tables to quantify that in the paper. Reliability is another major axis of admissible evidence. Evidence should be based on reliable data and methods that have been applied reliably. And the Daubert factors are whether a hypothesis is testable, whether there's an error rate associated with a method, has there been peer review, and has it been generally accepted in the scientific community, which is the only fry prong in half the states. And with true allele, the acceptance is quite widespread. It's been admitted after Fry or Daubert challenge in six states, as well as in Australia and the United Kingdom, largely based on validation studies. It's been used in hundreds of criminal cases and used in more than half of the states in the U.S., mainly for the prosecution, also for the defense. And there are crime labs who've been using True Allele for in California almost two years now. Uh, the first case involving True Allele was six years ago in Pennsylvania, for which there's appellate precedent. And what we find is that the main result of bringing true allele into a case is it brings the DNA back into a case. And now the case functions like a normal DNA case again, with the usual outcome being a guilty plea if someone is actually guilty. So here are some conclusions. Objective genotyping, where the program has no knowledge of the comparison profiles, can help eliminate examination bias because the calculator just doesn't know what the answer you want is. And when it's done separating genotypes, that information can be used to compare against one person, 10 people, or an entire database of a million people. Also, the identification information, the log or the likelihood ratio, is a standard information statistic that's very useful in assessing information in cases as well as in conducting validation studies. It takes all of these comparisons that are done between genotypes and reduces them to one number per comparison. That's a standard information number. Validation can establish accuracy, applicability, and error rates, which are useful in understanding the sort of evidence that you have and how you would use it and explain it in court. And Courts do need solid science that's empirically proven. For example, methods like CPI, which have a very simple likelihood function. They are a probabilistic genotyping method, but they use almost none of the data. They haven't been as rigorously assessed as some of the newer computer methods. So with solid science, better results can be achieved for real criminal justice, protecting people in society, and for conviction integrity. If you're interested in more information, there's a lifetime's worth of material you can read, watch, or listen to on Cybergenetics' website. Thank you very much.